dispose this waste uh, with the uh, unsafe manner, it creates a lot of environmental pollutions such as uh, air pollution, water pollution and land contamination. So today's session is organized to throw some light on these issues and how we can tackle these issues, you know, having aware about the best practices uh, we, which we can adopt to dispose this waste in a safe manner. Uh, so we have our uh, guest, today's guest for this session, uh, Man Manvel Alur, who is a uh, CEO and uh, founder of the uh, organization called Insight. Uh, Insight works for the betterment of the environmental environment and uh, they also have a mission to uh, create an eco-conscious community through programmatic solutions and behavioral change. And they are doing a lot of good works. They are one of their initiatives, uh, which is be responsible if I'm not wrong to uh, create awareness on the e-waste management as well as giving uh, people solution uh, how they can uh, come forward and dispose this waste in a safe manner. So we are very delighted, Manuel, to have you uh, uh, in today's session. And there are Saskin, a uh, lot of employees have joined us to uh, listen to your insight uh, uh, thoughts on this particular uh, issue. And also not only issue, but to give us the uh, ideas or maybe the best practices one can adopt in their personal lives. So welcome and over to you. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Sharinda. It's been a pleasure uh, always interacting with you uh, for many years now and uh, your team as well. So thank you for having me on this. And hopefully this is going to be an interactive session. So I'll just give a quick introduction about our organization, maybe two seconds, and then we'll go straight into uh, an interaction uh, session. Um, so like uh, Sharinda mentioned, uh, you know, the, uh, the NGO is called Environmental Synergies and Development. So basically the idea is to synergize the environment and development, which a lot of people always think they are two separate uh, you know, parts of the spectrum. So uh, the issue is that it's not really, and you know, we really need to find ways to kind of bring them together uh, and narrow the gap between the ending of you know, the spectrum. So I think that's really what our intent is. And our approach to that is to you know, utilize uh, uh, clear solutions, design solutions, uh, bring in communities so that they can adopt and take on the responsibility of, uh, you know, taking the ownership of the environment in a way, right? Uh, because we believe that that's the only way that this can actually really uh, kind of make a difference uh, and baby steps, multiplying steps and in a ripple effect will make the real change that we want to see. So all of our uh, programs are designed in that manner. And um, the three areas that we work in is uh, waste, uh, climate action, which is energy and climate action, and water. And across all of these three areas, we also do what we call experiential environmental education. So that's a very quick and broad spectrum of what we do. You can go on our website, you'll understand a lot more, but getting back to the topic of e-waste, um, so this is uh, this is an interesting area that we kind of adopted uh, uh, way back six years now. It's been six years since we've been working in this space. Uh, identifying this as a gap uh, solution uh, that needs to be addressed. Why is it a gap? Uh, a lot of people talk about electronic waste, talk, talk about you know um, the government's uh, action towards this new uh, beast that is coming our way. Uh, through some kind of policy and some some regulations that are there. Uh, but why is this a gap? Is because what is being addressed by the government is really about looking at what we call bulk generators or bulk producers and how they can be regulated under the uh, mandates to ensure that whatever they generate goes into uh, a proper stream of treatment and uh, disposal. But what doesn't get addressed is what you and me as individuals uh, generate at home. And uh, as you can imagine, over the years, many years now, uh, this has kind of completely escalated in terms of the amounts that we generate and the amount that we use. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll do a quick uh, presentation. But what I want to do uh, throughout the presentation is I would like you all to, uh, I don't know if you have the option to unmute, but if you don't, then at least put up your hand and you know ask the questions in the chat maybe. Uh, and if I'm able to see the chat, I'd be happy to answer as a long, uh, along 
the presentation so that it doesn't seem like a monologue and i you know i i appreciate any questions along the way uh, shirinda are you going to be sharing the presentation uh, yes yeah, so um, amia i will share the presentation okay great um so are you all able to see the screen i mean i think everybody is able to see it yes yes go ahead okay great okay so i'll just tell you a little like sharendra mentioned this program that we kick started 6 years ago is uh, it's called be responsible uh, it's uh, it's a pun on the word be responsible so the e stands for electronic and it's telling each one to be responsible about electronics and that's how we coined this word uh, this uh, title of the program uh and the intent of this is is two pronged uh, it's really to look at creating awareness but it's also to create a solution alongside the awareness because in no solution that has worked is you know that you can recognize anywhere in the world is when you have only awareness and not a solution or you have a solution with nobody knowing what what that solution is for so really it has to be two uh two parts of the same coin right and that's why this uh, program looks at both aspects of it and we uh, yeah go, go to the next slide please so all of us are very familiar about uh, these different streams of waste i mean largely in bangalore if you all are here most of you all are here i'm assuming uh, you know or or any part of india right now the wet and the dry waste is something that is a very very familiar to most people uh, but we have so many different streams of waste i mean and what i've listed out here is just four but there are tons and tons more and uh, but if you even if you even look at how we can manage these four categories of waste that is biodegradable that is all your food waste which can go in for composting or we call it wet waste uh, that would be one component of it uh, the other is your non biodegradable waste which is your recyclable material like your plastics your bottles your you know all of the other things that can get recycled but and they don't degrade in the natural environment and then you have your hazardous waste which is another area that we as an organization work on uh, your domestic hazardous waste which is your diapers your sanitary pads your syringes your medicines uh, expired medicines and all of that that go into that and the other critical area of course is e waste which is what we're talking about and all of you i think will know because you're all working for technology based companies and i mean everybody uses uh electronics on a daily basis uh you know all throughout their in their home so maybe i can just uh, quickly interject and ask if somebody wants to answer here uh can you just rattle off all the electronics that you have at home uh hi manvan vishal here yes vishal so i off the top of my head i can say laptops phones tablets I guess could we count could we count televisions televisions and their remotes as e waste? Yes, yes. Go through your house. Take right. a journey through your house. You'll you tell me what all electronics you have there. So electronics basically is anything that is that runs on electricity or on battery, right? So that's your broad definition of electronics. So go through your house and tell me what you think you can identify. Um, I guess it'd be lights. pen drives lamps okay. bulbs yes uh plug points as well like you know an extension boxes okay good uh, yeah so that's i mean that's from sitting in my room i'd have to like move around a little too much <laughs> to okay okay i'm going to ask you to move the kitchen now okay kitchen i guess would have the the mixers the grinders yeah. again Okay. I don't think with the gas stuff count I don't think so right because okay so we we'll, we'll go through a little bit more detail as we we go down the presentation but yeah that's great I mean that's a good start so I think everybody has all of those things that you mentioned at home right uh let's go to the next slide so so what what we define like I said earlier anything that is uh runs on battery or electricity is a electronic device and once it is something that is not of any value to us whether it is defective or it's not working or it's of no use we just junk it and that's usually what we could consider as e waste right and typically it is e waste which is non functional anymore i mean it's something that's uh you can't repair or reuse in any form and that's 
end of your life, and that's what we consider as electronic waste. So it consists of various things. I mean, so broad categories would go into two buckets. Uh, maybe the next slide will give us a little bit more uh, on that. Uh, yeah. So so basically, we we put it into two different categories. I mean, that's for just for ease of understanding. Uh, consumer goods and IT and telecommunication goods. So if you remember what you said, uh, Vishal, your, all your, uh, you know, telecommunication things that your laptops, your CPUs, your chargers, your mobile phones, all of that comes under, uh, under telecommunications and IT. And then you have a lot, lot of these things which are in your consumer goods, which is your TVs, your hair dryers, your microwaves, vacuum cleaners, all of those things come under uh, uh, your consumer goods section, right? Uh, let me just throw another question back at you all. Uh, if you look at your, say, all of us have washing machines today, right? Uh, what is electronic in your washing machine? The microcontroller placed in it, system mode power supply, cable, uh, the grounding material, the button sensors, the screen, uh, if there are uh, the motor, which runs inside. It is it is classified as electric, not electronic, but yeah, well, it falls under the same category. Yeah. And, uh, so, yeah. yeah. Of, yes. Yes. That's it. Oh, very good. Very good. I mean, I think I think what you've covered are two parts. Uh, two parts. Uh, one is the electronic, electrical part, right? And one is the electronic part, which is your motorized, your your drum and all of that, which is really a mechanical component of your washing machine, right? It's not really an electronic. So if you look at the larger the whole equipment by itself, you really have probably not more than less than about 20%, which is really constitutes what you call as electronic in that. The rest of it is basically a casing and then you have a machine that is more of a uh, mechanical uh, you know, component. So, but what, ha was a, what has happened in the regulations and rules that we have um, in, in India, and I think largely across the world as well, a lot of these things, even if they have a small portion, like for example, if you take your um, gym equipment, you really have just the front portion which tells you what your uh, exercise routine is going to look like. Apart from that, the rest of it is largely mechanical and you do have your cables and things like that. But all of this has been put into an EVS category that is for simplicity more than for anything else. So uh, can you go to the next slide, please? So if you look at the large components of e-waste that, I mean, the, the distribution of e-waste in India, if you look at it, almost 70% of electronic waste is your computer materials that are coming out today. And this is the categorization today. If you had look at, looked at something about 30, 40 years back, it would have been completely different. You would have had a different uh, configuration of this percentages. Then you have your telecommunication equipment, uh, which includes your cables, your phones, and all of the other things. Uh, then you have electrical equipment, you have medical equipment. This is a large, this, this component is increasing rapidly. And then you have other equipment like scrap that remains in your house. Uh, you know, it could be your remotes and your little other, other gadgets that you have, which is about 4%. Next slide, please. Okay, so so uh, seeing this coming uh, in a big way, I think the government of India many years ago in 2016 basically uh, put out uh, what's called the e-waste e management rules. Uh, it was notified by the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. And uh, what this really did was uh, first define what is electronic waste, of course, what are elect uh, what what components of uh, these various equipment and gadgets that we use fall under this uh, bucket. And who does this this uh, this regulation apply to? So the effect it became it was effective October 31st, 2016, and earlier it did not include CFLs and tube lights, but now it includes that. Now it, again, I'm throwing another question back at you: Is that what um, what is what do tube lights and CFLs have in them? What is the larger component in it? Uh, chlorofluorocarbons. Yeah, that is what CFL stands for. But what is that? I mean, is it a is it an electronic item or what is it? More of a chemical item, I guess. It's not electronic. Exactly, exactly. What about your batteries? Chemical, yes. Yeah, uh, electrolytes. Yeah. Correct. Excellent. Okay. So, so oh, while all of these are 
uh, there's a fine line between what we call as hazardous waste and what we call as electronic waste, right? So if you look at CFLs, tube lights, and batteries particularly, these are all actually hazardous waste because they have what you said, uh, chemicals in them, and they're toxic, right? But un, uh, in the new e-waste rules, they have been included as part of the uh, as part of the e-waste uh, uh, category. So the uh, the in interesting thing about this e-waste management rules is that it in, it in introduced something called extended producer responsibility, which basically is EPR for short. I mean that really means that companies which produce or generate electronic waste have a resp extended responsibility to make sure that they take it back at the end of its life of the product and ensure that it goes for responsible recycling. So that is what extended producer responsibility stands for. This in the country today applies for plastics as well as for uh, e-waste. Okay, And what they've done is that they have, because a lot of these large companies like your Apples, your Samsungs, your Godrej, your whatever, all of these are manufacturers, uh, cannot go back to the market and start collecting e-waste, say, in scrap or from you, from you and me in general. Uh, they have allowed what's called a producer responsibility organization, which is really an aggregator. So you have an aggregator organization which will collect it from the ground, so bringing it from the last mile, and help these larger companies ensure that they are able to meet these targets under the rules. Right Now, the targets for these com large companies uh, started at 10% every year, 10% of all the products that they put out and end of life. Um, and now it's it's been, they went back to, the you know discussion table and they kind of brought it down to seven percent. So there are there are that's just a percentage, but the point is that each of these companies are supposed to take back, bring back, and ensure that they pay for the management, responsible management of all the electronics that they're putting out in the market. And uh, so this is this is uh, part of the management rules. Yeah. Next slide, please. Yeah, so the other thing is it also states who can do it, right? Not everybody can go and collect. There are very, it's authorized agencies. They are mandated by the pollution control, local pollution control boards. And there is a complete tracking system that needs to be put in place to ensure that whatever you as a company, maybe if it's Saskin as a company generates, what can happen to, what happens to the e-waste that you give to your vendor for final uh, disposal. So everything has to be transparent. So this is completely done. Uh, through um, either an IT system or a seating system, but either way, it has to be quite transparent. Uh, the other thing is that your e-waste cannot be given to any scrap dealer. The scrap dealers or the dealers, uh, the, the recyclers are authorized, like I said, by the Pollution Control Board, and only those uh, authorized agencies can, can actually receive your e-waste. And they can also be responsible for collecting it from you. Uh, so ideally, you're not supposed to be giving it to any of the scrap dealers or kabadiwalas in the informal sector, which I'll tell you why that is uh, the the issue. Yeah, next slide, please. So okay, so India gets a bronze position globally in terms of uh, generation of e-waste. So uh, after China and United States, we uh, are third in line, and we generate huge amounts of uh, e-waste, close to about. 3.2, and it's somewhere across, this has gone up quite a bit now. This is 2020 data. They're estimating that will be 5.2 in the next year or so. So this is a huge problem. Uh, we are huge consumers of e-waste, one. Second, we are also huge, we have been historically huge dumping ground for e-waste. So a lot of the developed countries have been transporting their electronic waste to countries like India, Indonesia, uh, in different parts of Africa, where a lot of the recycling and the scrap scrap industry is has got a very uh, <clears throat> uh, huge industry. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, it's not a great position to be in, to be honest. Uh, we have not just the historic waste, plus we have a huge generation that's happening internally as well, uh, and we don't have the capability uh, in house to actually process this. <coughs> Uh, next slide, please. So, like I said, uh, the entire industry is extremely unsustainable. Uh, there are a lot of, I mean, these are UN reports, but you will see this kind of, uh, you know, this, this kind of pictures everywhere uh, nowadays. Uh, wherever you go, these are all old computers are still lying there. 
<laughs> people don't know what to do with them. They have a lot of chemical and toxic, toxic elements which have not been extracted. And so they're just ending up in different uh, locations which are extremely hazardous. Next slide, please. Uh, just, yeah, press on the next uh, button as well. It'll pop up, yeah. So why is it a problem? I mean, apart from the fact that I just mentioned the growing numbers of uh, in terms of quantity, uh, we have approximately 40 to 50 million tons of e-waste being generated annually. Uh, this is huge. This is a global number of which about 5.2 million uh, is approximately what India generates. Out of all of this, only 1.5% goes for any kind of recycling, right? So you can imagine what's happening. So the rest of it is all going to what's the unorganized sector, which then takes it, removes what is value, what they believe is valuable in a most inefficient way, and then it is sent to the landfill, right? So this is this is what is happening um, in, in our country and in a large part in a lot of the other countries as well. There are some new technologies that are coming in, but like I said earlier, uh, the quantum of waste is still a huge problem because we don't have the capability or the industry to back end it in terms of treatment. Uh, now the three largest cities that are producing e-waste uh, include Mumbai, New Delhi and Bangalore in that order. Uh, again, bronze medal, not, not much to be proud of. Next slide, please. Uh, you can stop me at any time and ask any questions, please, if that's uh, if anything is a burning question. Otherwise, we can take it at the end as well. Um, <clears throat> like I mentioned, 70 percent of the e-waste handle in India is produced elsewhere, which really means that all of our electronics, I mean, we, which we get, uh, whether it's China, Chinese brand or any other, uh, it's always produced somewhere else. And that's a huge problem because at the end of the day, we are consumers, we are using it and it ends up. Uh, in our uh, in our backyard. And this sector, uh, while I've written 37%, today it stands at 42%. It's growing annually at 42% is, is something which is really mind boggling because none of the waste streams, whether it's plastics or anything else can be seen in this kind of a, at this kind of a stage, right? I mean, this is 40% a year is huge. Uh, again, I said it's uh, also in, disposed largely in the informal sector and I'll take you through what that informal sector is. And uh, what are the toxic elements? I mean, like you mentioned earlier, we talked about the CFLs. We talked about it has mercury. So you're, you know, you, you, uh, if by mistake you break your CFL tube light before you hand it over, it, it actually emits mercury, which is extremely toxic. Then you have cadmium, lead. You have barium, chromium. These are all extremely dangerous toxic elements. The useful elements, on the other hand, are metal, glass, plastics, rubber, steel, which is there in some of the electronics that we have. And the informal sector is looking at this list on the right side, which is to be able to extract it so that they can, again, sell it to an industry which will need it as a raw material. Next slide, please. So this is what, in a snapshot, this is what the informal sector looks like, right? The metal extraction, which I just mentioned, the valuable substances are uh, metals and things that they remove through very corrosive acids. And you can see the kind of picture that shows you the unscientific methods in which they actually do this, right? It's all, they use extremely bad um, systems and very, very raw systems to, to actually extract these metals. They burn the PCBs. So you're having, you know, the toxic elements are burning with that because they want to extract all the met metals. And uh, while they're doing it, they're, of course, inhaling all of these toxic toxicities. You have close to about 4 million people plus, plus, plus in India working in this, uh, in this industry, in the informal sector, of which about 1 million are the children. So you have child labor, which is run through, because it's a very family-run kind of a business. A lot of the children get absorbed into this kind of a, uh, industry. And moreover, what's happening is the inefficient recovery of metals. So you have you have these metals, you have these valuable elements, but they can't recover it well because of the system that they follow. And uh, you know the the efficiency of improvement is uh, sorry of recovery is just about nine percent, which is really pathetic if you look at it because the amount of energy, amount of money. 
that the the world spends on getting these raw materials is huge i mean obviously you have to go to mines you have to you have an industry completely around that right uh, and on the other end you have um uh you know countries like china which are exploiting the mines in a far remote area like in congo where the mines ha- are some of the few mines in the world which have what you call rare earth elements right the rare earth elements obviously is rare and that's why they're so precious whether you have your lithium or whether you have um, you know cobalt these are very very rare but they all are required for electronics and the exploitation that happens in these mines is tremendous because you have uh b- because of the 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 value that each of these mines provide uh there is ethnic wars that are fought in these regions right? of course apart from that there's huge amount of child labor uh, employed in these mines as well yeah next slide please and of course at the end of it all there is the environmental uh damage that we have uh we have you know being the fact that it's thrown into landfills or alongside rivers like you see on the side on the streams you have groundwater runoff pollution heavy acidification and then of course it's since it's burnt along with the rest of the garbage uh, you have toxic elements that are being emitted into the into the climate as well and then resultant climate change issues is, uh, can happen next slide please and then resultant is your health impacts now this is a wheel that shows almost everything that is possible uh, right from cancer to skin rashes to nervous system damage uh, mis- you know miscarriages especially those uh, women and ch- who are working uh, in the in the industry in the informal sector uh, you know constantly getting lead in their hands getting you know mercury and all of that within their fingers in- ingesting all of that uh so a lot of this is coming back to us and also in the water systems when it goes to the groundwater system there is what is called bioaccumulation that happens in the plants and the crops that are grown in and around those areas so if it comes into the food stream at the end of the day we are again ingesting it and we are again getting impacted next slide please yeah so this is what the formal sector looks like i mean typically should look like and in some some industries in in, in our country look like this uh, where you have trained labor you have a, appropriate safety equipment for the workers there you have high end technology so the human intervention touching these toxic elements is r- limited and then you have safe disposal of hazardous residue uh, which then goes in to the government facilities for ultimate disposal and that has its own set of rules and regulations how that is done because you have a collection so a lot of these um the recycling industry and the the industry that works with the e waste looks like this yeah next slide please so obviously what is it that we can do uh, take another 5 minutes and then we'll go for q and a uh, this is a very so this is a very cliched kind of pyramid all of us know it uh but we rarely ever do it and i think it's always good to kind of remind ourselves over and over again uh obviously we want to first say do we really need something do we want this equipment do we can we live without it that's the first thing to do so prevention or refusing to to have it in your own homes then you go in for you know your reuse where you can repair it try and i mean obviously we have companies which are manufacturing things for sale it's to sell and to sell as many as they can not for it to last and so that's definitely an issue that uh, we have to contend with uh, because you know we want a smart phone we want a smarter phone we want the smartest and smartest of phones right uh, but can we do with this the smart phone as an example and the least favored obviously is the disposal but when we do come to disposal and we will at some point of time in all our electronics what kind of choices can we make yeah and that's where our program kind of stepped in yeah next slide please where we did uh, several different things like i mentioned we do the end to end solution so right from awareness campaigns uh, extensive uh, to providing the solution for collection and providing ensuring transparency for the final disposal so what we did was uh, we covered about 44 wards in bangalore uh, we conducted uh, over 400 500 
awareness campaigns like the one I'm doing right now. As before COVID, we did a lot of it on the ground in schools, colleges, resident associations, and the like. What we did was do this kind of a sensitization, but also say that, look, now you have an option. You can onboard your apartment or your institution, and we will do a regular collection for you. And ensure that we, because we have an MOU with the authorized recycler, it goes to that particular and the entire transparency through receipting, weighing, everything is given to the uh, point of contact in that particular uh, establishment. Uh, so there were three points, three systems for people to dispose of their e-waste. One is, like I said, on a, on call. So there is a hotline number and I'll talk to you about that. The second was uh, where we have a scheduled collection from the institution or the apartment. And the third was to have these drop-off boxes. On the right side of this slide, you can see that we have drop-off boxes uh, located at Bangalore One centers, post offices, retail stores. So we have 44 of these currently in Bangalore. Yeah, next slide, please. So I've gone through this, but awareness uh, was extensive, uh, and I can't even explain to what extent the extensiveness of it was because we did everything from radio to print media to uh, TV shows to on-ground campaigns through plays and uh, you know the works. So everything was uh, all kinds of formats were uh, utilized to bring awareness to different kinds of stakeholders. Next slide, please. And these were the collection options. Like I can, you can see that we had the van for the collection system. We had apartments who kept these blue drums. This was their own drum that they would, we, we'd give them the sticker and the uh, residents would, uh, you know, put it into that. And every once a month, we would have a scheduled collection that would go. Uh, and the, uh, the yellow box is something that you'll see in those public locations that I just mentioned. Next slide, please. Yeah, I think this is a kind of a repeat, but basically, like I said, this is what we, uh, uh, we where we collected from, right? So on call, pick up, education institutions, et cetera. Next slide, please. So we also calculated our impact. This is, this data is a little old. I uh, haven't got put this on the slide, but we have, you know, we collect data on the number of campaigns we conduct, how many people we have sensitized, how much of e-waste obviously that we have collected, what is the, how much of met, uh, toxic metals have we diverted from the landfill, how much of uh, metals have been recovered, and therefore they're also the uh, carbon emissions that we have produced. So this is the kind of impact statement that we uh, generate once we have collected the data. Next slide, please. Yeah. So you can visit this uh, website uh, and you can find out where is the lo uh, closest location drop box uh, near you. Yeah, so that's good. Uh, Sharinda, I think if we could just do a quick, uh, uh, you know, the video that I sent you, if you could show that, that's exactly two minutes. And then we can go into Q&A immediately. Sure. Uh, Vishal, uh, you can play that video. Here's the story of two brothers, mental and environmental. Two social geeks, high-tech freaks. They're a screen, they're a scream. Here a wire, there a fire. Big remotes and a little mouse. Electronics fill the house. When the updated gizmos came in, the outdated went into the dustbin. Actually, they didn't. You see, mental was also sentimental. It was funny how much he loved money. He said gadgets are old, but filled with gold. So to the gabadiwala, they were sold. His boys broke and bashed and burned the stuff, while babies and bees and geese died out because they'd had enough. Lead, cadmium and mercury poisoned the air, water and soil. All because mental wanted money to buy budgies fried in oil. Don't be mental, be environmental. Dispose of your e-waste at a collection center. Who knows, like him, you also might meet her. And have babies playing with bees and geese because you didn't sell your e-waste to buy budgies. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so this this program was in partnership with Asahas, uh, another uh, waste management company in Bangalore, or uh, NGO. And <clears throat> today we are uh, moving forward with the program. Uh, we have uh, trained an entrepreneur to help us do the collection because obviously continued sustenance of the program is very critical 
uh, we are still trying different models to make it sustainable and uh, but we still continue to provide services in, in and around Bangalore. We have piloted this in Mysore. We did a little bit in uh, Udupi as well. And uh, uh, yeah, we, you know, I look forward to any questions and answers. I think that's the end of the presentation. So. Hello, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is Charan. Uh, so thank you very much for this informative session. Uh, it took me through a self-introspective trip, uh, analyzing what I could do to reduce this uh, minus created by e-waste. All right. So coming to my question, uh, which one is it? Is it IC engine cars or EVs, electronic vehicles? <laughs> okay. So this this kind of throws open a Pandora's box, Charan, because uh, you know I haven't even touched upon what are the new kinds of e-waste that we're coming. Uh, it was just coming away. E e electronic, uh, sorry, e electric vehicles, solar energy. Um, these are hugely being pushed by the government, right? And there is no end in sight in terms of who's going to take care of this waste. We don't know yet. There are very few systems across the world, uh, almost none in India. They're just about starting to think about it. Um, but if you look at solar panels, for example, 20, 10 years from now, they're all going to be end of life. What's going to happen to them? EVs, very difficult because a lot of them are lithium. So I really don't know. It's, um, it's, it's, like, a, it's like a debate that we can have forever, which one is better. Uh, but honestly, I feel that older systems have, at least we have a recycling industry in place. So that's a choice that we have, but uh, I don't know if I've answered your question, but it's really hard. It's a, it's a very difficult choice to make. Yes, ma'am, because I was going through the uh, you know, what industry has got to offer the other day and batteries are huge. I mean, if you if you see the vehicles, especially if you take Tata, Nexon, which they have come up with, the entire base of the car is, is for battery. So the uh, warranty which the company offers is eight years. So best case scenario, if we consider the battery comes for 10 years, what after that? Because there is a huge fleet of cars coming into the market. So that's what I was thinking. And yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And I think uh, I was just giving a presentation the other day and one of the things that came up on EPR, which I had mentioned earlier in terms of extended producer responsibility, uh, why should it be there only for electronics in this form and, and also for uh, plastics? It has to be there for all industries, right? At the end of the day, if we if they are manufacturing it, it needs to be thought through what is the entire life cycle of a particular product. Where uh, you we cannot live in an economy anymore, which is make, use, throw. It cannot be linear economy anymore. It needs to be circular economy, which basically has to throw out this whole concept of waste. There should be no waste in the system, right? And it is possible, it is very possible in a lot of industries that is already happening in the construction industry that is happening. It is happening in so many different fields that even in the even in the automobile space that needs to be incorporated. If the batteries are going to be something that we're going to be piling up with our, uh, in our environment 10 years from now, uh, I don't think I'm okay with that. I don't think you're okay with it either. So, you know, really it's a, it's a difficult answer. Right. Okay. I think we, we need to wait for uh, battery technology to evolve, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I, I just hope it evolves as fast as battery technology has evolved, the recycling component or the manif you know the management of it. Right. That's always on the lag. Right. right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Somebody has raised the hand. Oh, uh, yeah. Prabhupada has raised his hand. Probably you can unmute and ask a question. Yeah, thank you so much, Vishal and Sally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good evening to our friends. It was really very, you know, interactive action, you know, sessions. What I've learned, it was really good. And yes, my friend actually, Sharon also told the same thing about the e car, about the nations. I was having the question in the same line, but however, I'm just going to ask about the BBMP. So yes, it is a very tough question. I may be, I think so. But how about, um, do you have any conversation with this particular BBMP or this, you know, 
uh, especially why I'm taking that name because we all are staying in the you know you know Bengaluru and I have seen many people many electrician of this particular office they will just replace the ball they just you know throw that ball in the you know you know very next to that pole or some of it. so are we talking with this particular BBMP people to take care about the e-waste or is it something BBMP has some kind of plan like the dry and waste way waste are he in are they coming up with some of this particular waste bin? So that's yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, so the issue with uh, there are two issues in what you have asked. One is uh, whether BBMP is collecting e-waste. So from regular households, the there is as per the solid waste management rules, which is something that the, the, that even BBMP has to follow is. Even e-waste has to be segregated at source and collected segregated. It is not happening. By 99% of the areas, it's not happening. And that's what that's the reason why one our program kind of started. Uh, the the uh, what is happening is that the collected waste is then mixed and it's being taken to uh, what's called the dry waste collection centers at each ward. And there there is some segregation. But by the time it, it reaches that. Point, there is almost nothing left. It's usually batteries or some bulbs, like you said, and some of it is thrown on the side of the road. Now, the reason it's thrown on the side of the road are two things. One is it's either broken uh, and therefore it has no value uh, and it, it cannot be, it, it's toxic, so people don't want to touch it. The second thing is even the recyclers today, even the ones that are authorized by the Pollution Control Board, do not have technology that is managing the extraction of mercury from these CFLs and tube lights so that they can effectively and responsibly manage the bulb part of it, the glass components. So there is no technology that is there today. And so within the limitations of what they have, BBMP is really not doing anything apart from doing some awareness programs. They have a couple of model wards that they have selected. Right now, I think there are three or four wards uh, in which sensitized citizens are doing taking uh, responsibility for collecting it separately and giving it to organizations like us but uh, by itself bbmp is not doing it they are they are mandated under, uh, under the law though thank you sure Oh, uh, ma'am, uh, it's me, Charan, again. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I recently got to know that uh, BBMP and other uh, organizations in Bangalore, government organizations, what they're doing is they're pushing this e-waste, which is coming in their way, which cannot be recycled towards a um, dump yard in Dabas pit, right? So it is, again, contaminating the groundwater table, and again, it is creating a havoc uh, to the population there. So are there any steps taken by you or any other uh, organizations around to reverse this uh, havoc created? I mean, if it is not there in place yet, are there any plans to bring up? Uh, yes, I think uh, uh, what you're saying is is basically the uh, waste that cannot be recycled. Uh, the the Dobbs Pit uh, area, which is the informal sector, has been there for many, many years. Uh, it's, it's not something that's new. Almost before even the recycling system came up, that I mean, uh, the formal recycling uh, establishments were there. This has been there forever. Uh, e Parisara, which is one of the earliest uh, recyclers in the country, also is you know located in very close to that area, and uh, they have been upscaling their technology to manage new kinds of e-waste that is coming. See, the the challenge is also not just for the, the BBMP, but also for the fact that the recyclers have to constantly keep pace with the new kind of electronics that are coming. Right. Now, earlier when they had phones, you had phones where you had were able to remove the batteries and you could manage those two components separately. Today, they're all integrated, so it, it gets even harder for uh, for uh, the recycler to manage it. Um, so there is there is a historic e-waste that is sitting in Dover's pet. There is e-waste that is what we call no value or low value e-waste, uh, which is your batteries and which don't have any uh, you know, components that can be used for by another industry like copper or, uh, you know, silver or gold or whatever that is being extracted. And that is unfortunately going into the landfill. 
Uh, some of it, like I mentioned earlier, if it is hazardous components that have to be extracted, that goes into what's called the, uh, it, it's a government facility, which is further out, not in Dobbisfair, which is really to look at sealing up uh, toxic elements in a, in, a, in a, they have a different scientific method for that. So all in all, it's not a very rosy story, but whatever it is today, that is that is the situation. So I think what is important for us is, as consumers is to realize that there is there are limitations and because of the because the system downstream has limitations how much do we want to continue contributing to it right so that's where the choice is and that's why i talked about that cliched pyramid uh, earlier on is that we have to start making those choices i hope that answers your question charan yeah yes thank you Uh, there's a there's a question that, or a comment at least in in the chat box which says about talks about uh, uh, people think... throw pens in ordinary bins without recycling. Yes, of course, that's uh, pens is another huge problem. There are a lot of that's what I said. There are so many waste streams that we don't even end up looking at, right? Um, ocean waste all over the place. Yes. Anything else? Any other specific question? Yeah, so uh, if there are no further questions, I'd like to invite Swami to just provide a formal vote of thanks. Uh, Swami, you're on mute. Uh, yeah, one of the hazards of teams, I guess. Manuel, thank you so much for taking time off and uh, coming and sensitizing us on this very important uh, topic. I think uh, there are noble professions like medicine and teaching. Now, I think the simple profession of managing waste is also getting into the realm of being a noble profession. There's no point in having a scholarly mind and a healthy body if you're going to live in an uh, environment which is full of toxic waste. So I think this forms another pillar of what I would call noble professions. And uh, to a very large extent, because of the passion of Sunil and Shailendra and several others in Team Prakriti in Saskin, we have done a bit, but I think today your talk uh, and it's recorded and it will be shared onward in our Saskin YouTube channel will sensitize the very source uh, where it can be nipped. I think you have instilled in all of us a thought that we are responsible for not just segregating wet and dry waste, but being very careful about the quantum of electronic waste that's surrounding us. Circular economy is definitely something uh, I believe uh, is to be used in a different metaphorical sense. I wish our economy slows down a bit. I don't think we need to move and gallop at this rate and keep producing more cars, whether electric or otherwise. We need to travel less or we need to use shared transport and be more sensible in terms of carpooling and not go in those large SUVs uh, all alone. Whether it's electric or <laughs> whether it's uh, fossil fuel, it won't make a difference. Uh, thank you so much for championing this cause for us. Thank you so much also for sensitizing and reminding us. I trust we'll have your permission to use that lovely video. And from mental, we will become more environmental. It's available on YouTube. Nice. Please do. Yeah, it was lovely. It was very nice. Uh, thank you so much on behalf of uh, the entire Saskin team, on behalf of Prakriti and everyone who participated eagerly in the session. Uh, Take a bow, ma'am. You've done a wonderful job. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me, and uh, you know, look forward to continued interaction. Um, anytime uh, you need uh, you need us to be there to just talk to your team, I'm be happy to do that. Uh, look forward to all of you, and thanks, Chalinda, and all the team to kind of organize this. Thank you, Mulani. What I'd also request the last word is uh, please go to the web uh, website and see. I think there are volunteering uh, activities that people can participate in. So as and when you feel it's safe, I have seen interns and I've seen their testimonials uh, on the on the site. So I think for all of you who are young and energetic, I think this is for, for that matter, anybody who's energetic, young or otherwise, it's a great option to intern and, you know, it'll add great CV value, tell me, and also it'll create a future which is better for your uh, next generation. So do take that opportunity and go to the website and, you know, learn more from there. Thank you, Shaili. Thank you, Manuel. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.
Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks, Team Prakriti. Thank you very much, guys.